Remember, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people. Can't learn it nor live it. And carnality, evidence of carnality is personal sin. That could be mental attitude types, sins of the tongue or overt sins. These need to be confessed in silence and privacy prior to study. This goes for the internet as well as the people in our presence uh, who are sitting in seats. So 1 John 1, 9 be an appropriate scripture for that. How do we get out of carnality back into spirituality of the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit, confession of sin? If I confess my sin, he's faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me. The, the, the cleansing in verse 9 goes back to verse 7, which refers to the blood of Christ. It takes the believer back to the cross, not for salvation, but for sanctification. Personal sin has hindered the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. You confess your sin because it is the work of Christ on the cross that always takes care of sin. And you should be reminded of your personal sin, the cost for grace to put you back into fellowship. It's a marvelous picture of God's grace that you can go back to the cross, not for salvation, but for sanctification. And he treats you in grace and love and mercy, just like he did before. So our Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way by the automobile and the internet. I pray, Father, as we prepare to study the word of God, that we prepare ourselves under the ministry of the teaching recall ministry of John 15, where Jesus instructed us on this. When the Holy Spirit would come, he would indwell us, and he would be the great teacher and recaller of doctrine to our souls. I pray today, Father, we have been spiritual enough to understand the importance of confession so that we get out of carnality. We can't study the Bible in carnality and we can't execute it in our life in carnality. It's flesh. God raised Jesus from the dead so that the Holy Spirit could indwell the, the spirit that raised him from the dead indwells our mortal body. Indwells our mortal body. And it's for the service of the plan of God out of the Christian's life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'll open your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 through 5. Hopefully, I'll show you some interesting things. <clears throat> Let me remind you, this is our 16th lesson. We are going through the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter by chapter, verse by verse to try to explain to you this letter that Paul wrote back. It's a wonderful, heartfelt letter. You get to see how, how deeply connected Paul becomes with the mission field. And uh, you can see the great love he has for these people and, and the desire to meet their spiritual needs. And in chapter 4, he begins with uh, Loipon, which is interesting. It's not, not so much interesting for Paul because Paul is now bringing this epistle into a final uh, encouragement. You know, in the second chapter, verse 11, he, said, <clears throat> 11, he says, I'm, <clears throat> I'm trying to exhort you, encourage you, and implore you to stand firm in your faith for the Lord. <clears throat> when he says, finally, it's loipon, and this would be like a lawyer in a court who's making his final appeal. He's wrapping all of his arguments up now. <clears throat> and that would be Paul's idea here when he says, finally, uses that Greek word. <clears throat> Finally, then, brethren, we request and exhort you. See, he's back to that, that he did in the second chapter, verse 11. Finally, then, brethren, he's bringing it all into some doctrinal, solid doctrinal understanding of what he thinks the doctrines that are important that they get under their belt. Finally, then, brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus Christ that as you receive from us instructions as to how you ought to walk and please God, just as you actually do walk, 
that you excel still more. And he's talking about the walk. That you excel still more in this walk. Now, what's interesting, what is this walk? What is this walk that he's talking about that we ought to walk to please God? And he encourages them, and you are, <clears throat> but I want you to excel in it even more. <clears throat> now he gets into the matter. For you know, that's Oida, for you know what commandments <clears throat> we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. One of the commandments he identified in verse 1, and you can't see it in English. And he's about to explain that one that he just explained, and his whole book is about specific doctrines necessary for the church age believer. I thought I heard myself echoing. <laughs> I thought that sounds like me. How's that possible? <laughs> and here's what he says. Now he's going to, what he's doing, what he's calling commandments. You will see today what he's talking about. He's not talking about old covenant. He's talking about new covenant. He's talking about specific doctrines. Jesus used that for his, my teachings. For you know, Oida, for you know what commandments we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, he spent three weeks teaching them milk, milk doctrines. Now he's going to get down to the doctrine of that he feels really important in this lesson. For this is the will of God, and he's talking about the walk, the walk that you should excel in, the walk that pleases God that you should excel in. This is the will of God, your Christian sanctification. We call that experiential sanctification. That's sanctification in the Christian life. The walk he's talking about to please God has is what he calls a commandment, an order. We would call it an imperative mood. Is experiential sanctification. <clears throat> that is... And he's going to explain why this doctrine is so important to their church at Thessalonica. It is because of the culture they live in. That you abstain from sexual immorality. I don't like the word immorality. The word in the Greek language is pornea. Paul is not talking about moral and immoral. He's talking about, that's, a, that's the way the unbelieving world lives, moral and immoral. That's all they got. That's not how the Christian church lives. They live under experiential sanctification. They walk to please God, not their flesh. And it doesn't matter if the world is moral or immoral. They need to get saved and the saved people have to live under the power of the Holy Spirit, not the flesh. God, why is it that after all these years, you still can't get that of sitting in the church and listening to the word of God? So abstain from sexual immorality. He's talking about there's a definite article, Tish, with the <clears throat> Greek word phornia. Por, por, pornea, look, pornea, P-O-R-N-E-I-A. It's on your paper. Look at this. Look, 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 look at something. What's the first four letters of the word pornea? Porn. Guess where that idea comes from? Porn. You understand? Is part of the, sec of the illicit sexual behavior of a culture. <clears throat> Pornea. It's all illicit sexual behavior of a society. And the Greeks were full of it, and so were the Romans, and so is America. Verse 4. 
that each, and listen, the answer to immoral and moral, listen, it's all flash. The answer is you got to be saved. And the answer is the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit called experiential sanctification. That's the walk he's talking about. Each of you know how that each of you, each of you individually, each of you as believers, each of you, each of you, each of you, that's your name should be there. Each of you know, Oida, how to possess his own vessel. Listen, that's his own body. What's he abstaining from? You understand what I'm telling you? Some people interpret this as your wife. That's not the subject of this. It's cultural sins. My, my, my. I'm just telling you what other people think. I'm not telling you what the Bible says. I'm telling you now, though, each of you know how to possess his own vessel, his body, in sanctification and honor. Not in lustful passion, like the Gentiles who do not know God, like the unbeliever. Paul is not talking about morality. He's talking about sanctification. My, my, my. I feel like I ought to pray again. <laughs> Maybe for me. <clears throat> well, in our, we're in our 16th lesson in this book. <clears throat> As we open today, the subject is excel walking with God. And boy, what a lesson we need in the church today of Jesus Christ. We've become worldly in the church, especially when it comes to sexual relationships. Paul opened today's lesson with a challenge to spiritually advancing believers. By that, I mean those who, have, who are moving off from milk and onto meat doctrines of the Christian life. We call it categorical Bible doctrine in this church. And there Paul is challenging them to excel still more in this walk. You're walking good. But listen, it's got to be every day, every minute. You say, oh, Ron, how could I get any work done? Listen, if you're flip-flopping between the Holy Spirit and the flesh all the days, all the moments of your life, I can understand that. But at some point, you ought to be walking steady in the ministry of the Holy Spirit and not flip-flopping back between your flesh and your spirit, the Holy Spirit. And when I make statements, I say, after, I'll have people write me or call me. And, uh, don't call me. <clears throat> but they want to know, well, man, if I was to live, if I was to walk in the Spirit every minute of every day, I could get nothing done. Listen, that's, you're telling me that you're living a Christian life of flip-flop. Listen, if you walk in the Spirit, you can get everything done better than you could ever get any half thing done in the flesh. My, my, my. My, my, my. What kind of crazy talk is that? You're to walk every, listen. Been studying the book of Jonah to teach on, on Wednesday, to teach us, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. We're, we're there. So I've been, been studying it to go in there and find what are the things going on in the days that I should be aware of in mind. You know, I've told you, but listen, evil, that's Satan's deal. The reason the flood came upon the antediluvian world, their, their hearts the in the in thoughts and intentions of their heart were evil every minute of every day, the Hebrew says. When I hear the church that doesn't understand how to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit and go like, well, if I walked in the if I walked in the power of the Spirit, I, 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 if I, if I, I I wouldn't be able to get anything done. My my my. Shows me you don't know anything about walking in the spirit. It's not a chore to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. It's a volitional choice. 
You need Jesus every minute of every hour of every day. Don't you know that? Now, how are you going to access him? Through the power of the Holy Spirit and the word of God. My, my, my. Well, Paul writes, finally then, brethren, I want, to, I want to show you something. So get ready with your pencil. You got your pencil out? Get your pencil out. Come on now. This is classroom. Nah, I don't even ask you to bring notebooks anymore, but I do ask you to bring a Bible and a, pe a pencil, right? I may go back to the old day. I think people learn more. Finally then, brethren, watch this. We request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus. I get, this is on your paper. See the word that? As. The word that's hina. Now, normally when you see hina, you got a subjunctive. Not now. Not now. This hina is used as a marker. Along with the word K-A-T-H-O-S. Kathos. It's an adverb. It's a comparative adverb. And look, you ought to somehow isolate this. Yeah, I put brackets. Put brackets that as you receive from us instructions as how you ought to walk and please God and then put the other part of the bracket at the end of God. Are you with me? Please do that. You have no idea how long it took me in the Greek language to know this. Give me courtesy. That's number one that Paul is saying. See, just as, put, this, put another bracket there. Because we're going to have another idea that Paul's introducing. See the word just as? That's kathos. That's K-A-T-H-O-S. That's the adverb, that comparative adverb. Just as you all, just as you actually do walk, see the word that? That's hina. See, I have two of them. I have two hina kathoses. They set up two complete, complete important ideas, like a point one, point two. On the other side of that bracket, Excel still more. So here's Paul's idea. Finally, brethren, I want you to get this doctrine under your belt. Experiential sanctification. And here's what I want you to remember about experiential sanctification, that you received this instructions, teaching instructions, as to how to walk and to please God. That's the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. Secondly, just as you actually do walk, I, I thank you for that and I encourage you that's what you should be doing. Paul is cheering them on. That you, see, the other point is that you excel, excel even more in this walk. That walk is experiential sanctification in theology. Got that? That's two ideas in this doctrine that Paul wants to get over to them. Point number one, Paul's teaching outline of the fourth chapter one through five is always interesting to me. I always love the way Paul introduces a new idea or, or expands on an idea. Now, remember, this was a letter. It wasn't written in chapters and all that, so you have to look for that stuff in the Greek. Our, our present lesson passage, chapter 4, 1 through 5, is a good example of this idea. It, the way Paul connects important doctrines to the cultural living, I tell you, if you read his epistles, he is after that. Listen, it's not the culture of yesterday that we have to struggle with. It's the culture we live in today. And we have, to, we have to live, quote, victorious. How do you do that? Paul says, I'm going to tell you. And I'll tell you one area that's getting the church, he says. Sexual, he, 
English translated sexual immorality. He called it with a definite article, Tish Fornia. Out of the old covenant, they would have called it the failing cult. Paul is dealing with Greek and Roman culture. Just like the church has always had to deal with it. See, the devil found something that really works. In the old covenant, it was, we called it the failing cult. In the Greek, it's cultural sins. They always have been. It's it's still the old, it's still Satan's old strategy of the failing cult. My, my, my. <clears throat> the old covenant believers struggled with it. New covenant believers struggled with it because the devil's found a thing that works. Now, in my opinion, Paul took verses one through five and broke them into three ideas. Paul reminded them why walking to please God was important to them personally as well as culturally. I mean, how do you stop the mess in your culture? Change people's hearts. Getting them saved is one thing. They got positional sanctification. But getting them to live out the Christian life is how the culture has changed. It's changed with each of us, changing our behavioral structure and the way we think. Is that how categorical doctrine fit your life and how the changes you've made in your life and why you don't buy into the stupidity of the world? Right? Otherwise, you're in the stupidity of the world. It's either the word of God in your soul working or you're in the stupidity of the world, 1 John 5, 19. And you're in one of them. Well, there's not a garden of Eden that separates us. We're in a mess. And Paul deals with this in verse 1. He introduces them to this idea. I want you to, I want you to walk to please God, not yourself. Yeah, listen, personal sin is pleasing yourself. James 1, uh, 14 and 15. I'm on my. Paul's doctrinal answer to this cultural problem in the church was experiential sanctification. It is living in the dynamics of the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit every minute of every day of every hour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know, people. In verses 2 and 3, I want to show you something. For you know what commandment we gave you in verse 2. What commandment we gave you. What commandment we gave you. In verse 1, look back to verse 1 on top of your paper. See the second time he says walk? Is it, you put him in brackets. Did you, did you put him in brackets? Otherwise, you don't know what I'm talking about. In the second bracket, see... See the word walk? Yes. In the second bracket, see the word walk? Let me tell you something about it. It's a present imperative. Don't look like it in English, but it is in the Greek. It's an imperative. That's what Paul refers to when he calls it a commandment. You got to know that stuff when you study the New Testament. We're not talking about old, we're not talking about the 10, ten law. We're talking about something that is relevant for the church age. He's talking about, it, and he's going to explain what he means. He's going to mean experiential sanctification. He's going to explain the walk. He's going to explain it to you. It's called a commandment. In verse 2, for you know, oida, oida, something Paul has taught them that they now understand and are walking out. He says, you know what commandment we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus, who is the head of the church. The commandment that came from the Lord Jesus Christ to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Paul is talking about. 
Look, geez, this is not that hard. Come on. See the word commandment? See the word command? Do you see the word command? That's an imperative idea. An imperative mood is a command. Oh, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just, my job's to teach you. I can't make you learn, but I, I can teach. The doctrinal answer in this verse, in verse three, for this, for this, that he's talking about, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. Yours is Christians. That is, that you abstain from fornication with a definite article. It's not sexual immorality. Ah, jeez. How, how do these ideas ever creep into us? The third thing that Paul gives us in the first five verses, Paul's reasoning for further teaching on experiential sanctification is because of the cultural illicit sexual behavior of people in the church that haven't separated themselves from the culture of sexual behavior. See, if it's moral and immoral, if I'm immoral, I just become moral. That's not what Paul's talking about. An unbeliever can do that. An unbeliever can be immoral and stop being immoral. I know a lot of people who are immoral Christians who got married and stopped doing that and brought it, brought, brought, they changed it because they got married. Moral, immoral. They're moral. They're married. They didn't think that they should have been moral when they were immoral. Listen. Listen, their whole problem as a Christian was they weren't, they didn't, weren't experience, living in experiential sanctification. It's not moral and moral. Gee whiz, church. You're buying into the way the world thinks. And he'll, they'll listen, the devil will rub your nose in it. Salvation is positional sanctification. The Christian life is experiential sanctification. And you got to get out of cultural norms and standards or mores and live the dynamics of the Christian life so that the world can find a reason to go to Christ for salvation. Paul says, when the Christian church lives in carnality in 1 Corinthians 3.3, 3, you appear to be like the rest of the world as mere men with no dynamics of supernatural power in your life. Let me tell you, the church of Jesus Christ in the 21st century has got a lot of explaining to do to the Lord. They don't know the difference between moral and immoral. Culturally. Let alone anything about sanctification. My, my, my. And when you walk in the flesh... You walk as the world walks. You don't walk as God walks. Whether it's a moral walk or an immoral walk, the walk has to be sanctified by the power of the Holy Spirit. I don't know why I'm hollering. I'm hoping somebody outside the building will listen to me. Paul says what you've bought into culturally has got to change by the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. He called it tis, T-E-S, pornia. Point number two. There ought to be four questions at this point, at least in my mind, for us to consider and to receive, as Paul said, receive the answer. How does a, a, a believer walk to please God? Not by the law, not by the law, but by the grace system. What, how's the grace system walk? Well, this is Perry Pateo. This is walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. This is experiential. Say he calls it. He calls it in the in the verse. He calls it hohegiasmas. 
You walk in the sanctification of the Christian life. How do you do that? You know what the answer is? Well, I'm going to give it to you because it could be a gay question. Experiential sanctification. Is that what he told you? It's what he told you. That's what he's teaching. That's the answer to question one. So question two, what is the stated will of God? It's, it's stated to abstain from his fornication by the power of experiential sanctification. By the power of experiential sanctification, by the power of the Holy Spirit inside you. Galatians 5, 16, don't walk in the flesh, walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. What's the answer to that question? Well, experiential sanctification, right? Here's third question. What, it, what, what is the doctrine? What's the categorical doctrine? Sanctification. There's three parts to sanctification. The person who just gets saved, that's positional sanctification. I taught that last week. For the Christian, it's experiential sanctification, which Paul was talking about. And, and listen, for the believer at death, it's ultimate sanctification. Absent from the body, present with the Lord business. We talked about that last week. So what's the answer? What is the doctrine? Experiential sanctification. Agree? Yeah. How does a believer excel? How does he excel in it? Still more. You got you to bring this walking system into your life every minute of every hour of every day. You understand that? How are you going to excel? Excel in what? Experiential sanctification. What is that? Walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. Not ever giving in to your flesh. Always giving in to the, to the will of God through the Holy Spirit. Listen, when you read Galatians uh, 5, 16, and 17, it, it tells you in verse 17 that these two struggle against one another, the flesh versus the spirit, the lust of the flesh versus the lust of the spirit, so that at any given point you can't do, you can't please. So who are you going to please? You're going to walk in the flesh and please yourself, or you're going to walk in the spirit and please God? See, walking in the spirit pleases God. So what's the answer? Experiential sanctification. What's he talking about? Click it up a notch, right? You say, well, I think I'm doing pretty good. Pretty good is not enough. Excel. I ran track in high school. I had a wonderful track coach. We would run. He said, "He would say, Adam, hey, come over here. I come over. How do you think you did? That's when we practice among ourselves. I did pretty good. I beat. I won my heat. Then we would go play another school. And the coach would come to me and he say, Adam, hey, how do you think you did?" I said, well, I, I did pretty good. I played second. This kid's really good. Or am I might say I, I won it. About the third time I ran my freshman year. He said to me, you know what the state record is in, in, in your race? I said, no, I don't have an idea. He said, well, that's that's... That's why you'll never excel because you don't have any goals in your life. You think all you got to do is run, run to win a, a heat or run to run a weight race. Now, the prize is bigger than that, son. You know? You act like just because you're running a certain level that that level is enough for what, what the race is. Listen, you entered a race where that's the prize. Well, let me tell you, I wasn't ready, I wasn't running towards that deal. He said, "Do you know the last time that that has been broke, Adama?" I said, "No, sir." Well, he gave me—I don't remember now. 
But he gave, told me what, the last time that, that number had been broken. The guy who ran that, the one guy that held it before, he said, you know why? Nobody, nobody runs your race. You think it's enough just to win your little heat or little thing? You ought to be running for that, Adama. You know what it changed in my life? You know what changed in my life? How do I do that, coach? See, I never asked him that until my third race. Then how do I do that? Now he's got somebody he can coach, can't he? He's got a kid he can coach. He didn't have a kid he could coach. Kid thought he knew what he was doing. And I became a real student of that. I didn't break that record. I wish I could have said, and I broke that record. I didn't break that record, but let me tell you, I became such a better athlete, and I learned so much more about my life. And as I grew older in my life, I became more respectful of a wonderful coach. He never asked me those questions ever again. They were always other positive ways of stating that to me. We're going to do block work next week, Adama. We're getting off the block. You're losing just a little bit off the block. Those who race track know what I'm talking about. Well, anyhow, the word excel. See, when I see that word excel, that's a dynamite word. This meandering down the road, taking your own good time, just, to, you know, just the main thing is I get from there. It don't matter how quick or what I'm doing. I'm just meandering down the road. I'm walking down the road, meandering. He goes like, nah, 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 nah. Come on, we got to excel in that walk. <laughs> yeah. We got to excel in it. We got to excel in it. Three. Last week, we introduced these three phases. I put them on your paper again. Go to point four. For those on the internet, so I didn't hear them. Well, look, that's the power of the internet. You can go pick them up. Point number four. Experiential sanctification is how the Christian, the church age believers, that's what that stands for, cabs, the church age believers walk to please God and honor God to the world and to the angelic conflict in an invisible war called the angelic conflict. You know, when you walk that walk, it pleases God. It stuns the world. It affects the world that you walk that way. Let me tell you, people know, people take note of godly people, sanctified people, people who are saints that are saints, who, who walk their identity every day. They walk it. They walk it in the home. They walk it in the neighborhood. They walk it at school. They walk it at work. They walk it. They walk it. They don't just talk it. They walk it. We need to be those kind of people. We need to be those kind of people. In our lesson text, Paul shows the warfare between the flesh engaged in cultural norms and standards that are in conflict with experiential sanctification. And he's encouraging him. He was like my coach. He went like, look, Adama, 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 you're, you're running. I, I like you're out for track. I like that you're running. But listen, You've got to get into the and but he did it just in an interesting way to me to challenge me. And that's what Paul is doing. That's what I hope I'm doing. Just trying to challenge you. You're walking, but you're walk, not walking enough. You're you're lollygagging. Does that make sense to anybody bother me? Meandering down the road. Yeah, they got it. Strolling. Huh? Strolling. Strolling. That's going too fast. I want to get it slower than that, Gary. I want to slow it down more than that. So he says, this is the will of God, your sanctification. That is that you abstain. This is a compound word. It has apple in the front of echo. 
It's a present act infinitive, and you are to abstain from, which is apo plus the ablative of separation. He is asking you, he is asking me to abstain, to separate ourselves from this kind of behavior. Now, the one word I didn't put down on your paper of what he's talking about, you should put, because I was going to tell you the word porn comes from pornea. <laughs> Jeez. <clears throat> the devil, you know, isn't he bold? Pornea, pornea is a negative culturally. It's what destroys a culture. He takes it and glorifies it. Porn. Made a business out of it with the church. This is the will of God. Notice where, where they have the word immorality. Notice that's, that's fornication. Notice that it's the T-E-S. That's a definite article on the front of this word pornea. And that definite article is really important because it sets it off as a category. He says, I'm talking about pornea. I'm talking about the category. Therefore, you're looking at everything that would fall under that category called pornea. And of course, the first thing that should be there is porn. That's what pornea is about, porn. The visual part. The visual part of it. Buying, listen, the devil buys your mind and then your body. Sometimes he buys your body and then your mind. He's giving you a heads up when he calls it porn, what he's trying to, what he's trying to win in your life. And what is the answer? Experiential sanctification. Don't go there. Don't go there to gratify your flesh. Go to gratify the Holy Spirit. There's a better way for your life. Let me tell you. Lord won't let you slide on it anymore because I laid the lesson on you. So here's an example. Porn would be one example that's obvious. The other would be sex outside of marriage, adultery, homosexuality, lesbianism, bestiality, pederasty, incest, and sodomy. That's just a measure of it. Listen, when I first came into Christianity in the very early 60s, this was understood. This was understood in the church of Jesus Christ. And, and listen, and that was preached about. And it was preached that it would destroy the culture of America and the church of Jesus Christ that was sending missionaries everywhere in the world. Boy, boy, boy. What, what has happened to us? This definite article, Tish, on pornea sets up category. It's a category, and there are categories underneath it. I mean, where are you going to hear this message preached today, even, even though it's in the Bible? Where are you going to hear that? <laughs> Christian families are torn apart by this stuff. Christian families are absolutely torn apart by having their, their kids and their grandkids and all that kind of stuff messed up in all this stuff, and they think it's, it's okay. It's become culturally acceptable. The failing cult has become socially acceptable, even in the church. Well, I don't see why we can't have a homosexual pastor pastor our church. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Or pederasty, oh, we'll put him over the child's programs, huh? My, 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 what has happened to us today? Afraid to talk about these things in the pulpit. It's the word of God. What are you going to do, skip that? My, my, my. The church of Jesus Christ, Paul says you've got to separate yourself and not feel cheated. 
You have to separate yourself from this kind of behavior and feel not cheated. So how do, what's God's answer? It, the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Let me tell you, there's more fun in this world by living in the power of the Holy Spirit every day of your life than there is not living and living in the world. Let me tell you, it's fun. It's fun to walk to please God. It's fun. It's just what you, how you define fun. It's fun to bring people into the kingdom of God. It's fun to share truths that set people free from the bondage of sin. Let me close. Paul is not teaching on, on morality. He is teaching on experiential sanctification, which is the doctrinal answer or the solution for the cultural types of sexual sins that the Corinthians were in in America as well. The key doctrine associated with our text today is experiential sanctification by walking by means of the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit rather than the sin nature. We are encouraged by Paul that each of us know Oida how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor and not lustful passions like the unbelievers. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 in closing. But we have this treasure in earthly vessels so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. What a wonderful passage. Well, let's close in a word of prayer and go downstairs and have a cup of coffee and a donut. And then we'll come back for the second service after about 15, 20 minutes. Father, we're thankful today for these that will cover our way by the automobile and the internet. The church of Jesus Christ has become, has, has, has got to become engaged with the doctrine of experiential sanctification. How do I live the Christian life apart from all of the world? You're in the world, but not of the world. And boy, Paul's explained that today. And where does the power come for me to live this way and not feel cheated? By the power and the dynamics of the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Dear God, teach us this message. Teach it across the world, Father, by the internet. We pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.